Hello, and welcome to our Bible study on glorifying God through my retirement, illness, and death, presented by the West End Church of Christ in Bowling Green, Kentucky. My name is James McClunny, and I, along with my co-teacher, Carol Duckworth, want to thank you for joining in the study made available on the church's YouTube channel. It's appropriate, and I'm sure Carol intended it this way, that we would wrap up our study on glorifying God with the conclusion of life, retirement, illness, and death. It was appropriate also for me to take this study because I'm the only one who is retired or at least living on retirement. Plus, I have dealt with illness and death in a very up close and personal way. Before getting hit with the illness and death of my dad in 2016, I was able to leave my corporate job in 2015 and start drawing my pension, which allowed me to preach for a small congregation and preaching is what I love to do. So for four years, I preached for the small congregation in Clearwater, Florida. However, for the last two years of my preaching there, my in-laws were suffering from illness, which required my wife and I to care for them. Eventually, the work of caring for them became so time consuming that I retired again and we moved here to care for my grandson. While I would love to work with the church preaching on a full-time basis, my time and energy was needed for helping my wife care for my father-in-law until his death last year, as well as my mother-in-law and grandson on an ongoing basis. So that has really kept me occupied during my retirement. Of course, I didn't completely retire. I was able to build on my previous teaching work of daily Bible studies that I've been doing for a number of years on Facebook by adding a new page for video studies called An American Missionary. I also added a YouTube channel of the same name for those who have internet access, but don't do Facebook. I had initially intended multiple series of sermons along with a daily three-minute video study called Morning Minutes in the Bible, but the day-to-day -day work with my mother-in-law and grandson didn't let me keep up with the full-length sermon series. However, since my mother-in-law moved into an assisted living facility last week, my plan is to jump back into recording and posting video sermons on a more consistent basis to unretire in a sense. Now, because the virus pandemic caused changes to our schedule, this study will be broken down into three classes, three. This one posted for Sunday, June 21st, will be on the subject of retirement, on the subject of retirement. It's gonna be about that single object. And then the next ones will be about an illness and then on about death. On Wednesday, next Wednesday, we will hold two Zoom meetings with those who participate on a regular basis. And anyone else who wants to join in that, uh, that uh, needs those connections, I'll, I'll provide that for you as well. At 7 p.m., we're gonna study the topic of illness. And then at 7.45, with, uh, we'll take a five minute break and then at 745 we'll come back and study the topic of death. Knock both of those out on Wednesday evening, one to be post, posted for that night later and then one to be posted for the last class on Sunday. So there's a final class, kind of a, a wrap up session on uh, the uh, in July, on July 1st I believe it is, presented by, um, uh, by Carol. But that's, that's going to be at the end, that'll be the last kind of concluding class. I'll post the links for those studies on the church's Facebook news page. Well, let's start our study now with a prayer, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word, to learn from you, the one who created us, how you would have us prepare for and approach the last days of our lives, the last years of our lives as we reach retirement age, what is known as retirement age here in this country, and than the illness and death that to follow those things. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you and honor you. And we pray that as we understand what retirement is and how to approach it, that we will serve you no matter what we do in our latter days. Thank you for the forgiveness because we fail and we need it so desperately. Thank you for the forgiveness that is available only in Jesus Christ and for those who repent and turn to him. Give us a heart of repentance and submission to his will in all things. In his name we pray. Amen. Now, this class is on glorifying God. And as we've been working our way through these series of studies, 
Carol had picked out two verses, two great passages as our theme verses for this study. First Corinthians 6, verse 20, which says, For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So we belong to God, body, soul, and spirit, body, soul, and mind. So we need to be glorifying God, lifting God up in praise with our bodies and with our minds and with our lips. Therefore, he says in verse 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So we need to humble ourselves, approach God with humility and recognition that he is the creator, he is our God, and that we are looking forward to him and serving him and living for him and being with him in eternity. And so that's why we glorify God. We belong to him and we need to glorify him and we need to let him glorify us to whatever extent he wants to cho uh, chooses to glorify us. Well, let's look at our next, at our study here. And we think about this idea of retirement, illness, and death. As I get older, it's clear to me that this is the natural progression, especially here in America, at least for the past 100 years. Retirement is followed by illness, which ends in death. That's kind of the pattern that we see. That's a normal pattern. Sometimes death comes more quickly, but the retirement followed by illness that is followed by death. Across most of the world, even today and here in America up until about a hundred years or so ago, there was a slightly different natural progression. Aging with its consequent illness than death. I say that because retirement is a relatively new invention of Western civilization that has developed since the Industrial Revolution. Prior to that, lifespans were much shorter and pensions, private or public, just didn't exist. Families were typically larger, so the aged didn't retire. Instead, they lived with family until they died, usually while still doing some kind of work as they were able. Those who lived beyond their ability to work were cared for by their family until death. It wasn't pretty or easy. And I can attest to that personally, having cared for my father-in-law for two years until his death and my mother-in-law for three years and counting. So it, it just isn't pretty. There's nothing about it that, that's nice as people get old and, and get into the illness and death stage. But we'll talk about that more in the next two studies. Western or so-called Christian nations have developed retirement plans for their aging populations with the first one in Germany in 1899. Just think of that, 121 years ago. But in America, it has developed into an entire industry and taken on these huge mythical properties. In the 1800s, as the Industrial Revolution changed culture and more old folks needed assistance, private facilities were created and operated by various churches and civic organizations. In the 20th century, local and state governments got involved in setting standards, got involved in setting standards and overseeing them. Social Security was enacted in 1935, and with the first taxes and benefit pay and payments made in 1937. So we're talking less than 100 years ago, less than 80 years ago. And the start, actually 80 years ago, and the start of the first full-time monthly benefits were in 1940. That's just 80 years ago. AARP, American uh, Association for Retired Persons, was founded in 1958. Retirement communities began to boom for retired people in Arizona and Florida in the 1950s and 60s. Folk would, people would retire there and live with people their own age, playing tennis and golf. Others would buy motorhomes and travel the U.S. All these millions of retirees just living the good life of retirement, hoping, hoping to hold off the inevitable illness and death. Well, they're not going to hold it off forever, but maybe for a little while. Well, the question for us that is simple is how should Christians, how should I as a Christian approach retirement? Well, as with every single part of life that we've been looking at in these studies with a mindset of glorifying God, that, that's how we do it. We're trying to glorify God. That's what we try to do. And so as we do that, we're gonna go through the seven set of questions that we've been working our way through on a regular basis and we're gonna start with question number one, which is how can I glorify God through my retirement? This has been the same pattern. We'll do this with illness and we'll do this with death as well. 
Now, each of you likely has some ideas and thoughts on this, and we could fill pages and hours with answers. But let's settle for just three, just three basic answers. And the main passage we want to look at is probably not one you would expect. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 33. 2 Chronicles 33. The nice thing is you can pause while uh, you, you turn to that, when you get your Bible and turn to that. In 2 Chronicles 33, we're going to read the story of one of Israel's most wicked kings, a man named Manasseh. Now, we're not going to read the entire chapter, just bits and pieces of it, but I want you to notice something about the text. In verse 1, it says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. Now, it says he was 12 years old when he became king, but it's imperative for us to understand there is a significant overlap with his father, Hezekiah. Once you realize there are multiple overlaps in the kings, it makes it a whole lot easier to figure out the chronology and the time frame. Otherwise, if you just plugged in the numbers and added them all up, they wouldn't add up, and the kingdom would be over 100 years too long. So you have to recognize that there is overlap between the various kings. But Hezekiah, so Manasseh was made a co-regent at the age of 12 with his father Hezekiah in 696 B.C. But Hezekiah didn't die for 10 more years until 686 B.C. So Manasseh became sole ruler at the age of 22. And as soon as dear old dad was dead, he restored all the idolatry that Hezekiah had removed. And after 40 years, God let Assyria capture Manasseh and carry him off into captivity where his will was finally broken. And like the prodigal son of Jesus' parable, he came to himself. Look at verses 12 and 13 of 2 Chronicles 33. 2 Chronicles 33, verses 12 and 13. When he was in distress, he entreated the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly, greatly before the God of his fathers. When he prayed to him, he was moved by his entreaty and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem, to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. You might want to make a note to go back and read Deuteronomy chapter 38, uh, 28. And uh, 28 talks a lot about how when people are carried off into captivity and they repent and turn to God, that God will hear them. Well, we see this happening right here with Manasseh. So Manasseh, so he's 22, so 40 years, that's 62. So he's in his retirement years. And in his retirement years, he returned after having led the nation and so far into idolatry, returned to Jerusalem with a repentant heart, with a penitent heart, and sought to glorify God, glorify God in three ways. That's what we want to talk about tonight. First of all, by continuing to serve God. Notice two things here in the text that we see about his continuing to serve God. First, he humbled himself before God greatly. In other words, he was broken. His will, his pride, all of that was stripped away, and now he was bowing before God. He recognized he needed God and was putting his faith and his trust in God. Two, he knew that Yahweh was God. Notice at the end of verse 13. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, and the word Lord there is Yahweh in the Hebrew, the Lord was God. So he got it. He understood that this, the I am, is who he needed to be worshipped. And now, presumably, presumably, all of you watching this video are already serving God and have been for some time. You're not waiting until your retirement years to come back and serve God. Uh, which is why it's the word continue, not begin, there at the, as the point there in the PowerPoint. Regardless of whether you have or have not, though, now is the time with all your heart to humble yourself before God, to know Yahweh is God. Yahweh means I am, God's personal name given to Moses at Mount Sinai, where he told Moses, I am that I am. And it's the idea of his personal name being an identification of his eternal existence, eternal self-existence as the all-powerful being. There is no God. That's why it's easy to say there is no other God like him. He is existent. He is self-existent. He is eternally self-existent, and he is all-powerful. He has all power to recreate and bring the world into existence. So what we need to do if we're going to glorify God in our retirement years, 
to swallow our pride, humble ourselves before the great I am and serve him because of who he is. We need to be thinking of who God is and how we can serve him. The second thing is continue to serve your spiritual family. Look at verses 14 through 17. We won't read this because I, I just don't want to run out of time, but he comes back home in verse 14 and he rebuilds the walls and the gates to protect the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. And he got army commanders in all the fortified cities of Judah. So he prepared to defend his people. But notice what else he did in verse 15. He also removed the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord. I mean, this guy had put an idol in the temple of Jehovah and he took it out now. He's serving his spiritual family, his church, his nation, the nation of Israel. He removed the idol from the house of the Lord, as well as all the altars which he had built on the mountain of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem, and he threw them outside the city. He took them out to the dump, to the city dump. He set up the altar of the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings there and thank offerings on it, and he ordered Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. So now he's coming back to the God, the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed, and so there were problems with the people, but he was determined to bring them back to God, to bring them back to the Lord. Manasseh focused on survive, uh, serving the surviving nation. Israel had been already carried off into captivity. Judah and Benjamin are left along with some of the uh, refugees who had come back to Judah from the other tribes. Manasseh now was focused on trying to serve them where previously he had ignored God's will. Look back in chapter 10, or, or excuse me, verse 10, chapter 33. Verse 10, the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. He didn't do what God said. He didn't listen to God. God sent prophets, obviously, and he had the law, and he ignored all of it. Well, now God has his attention. And now he's focused on hearing God and restoring God a worship that is according to God's will. The younger generation, think of it in terms for us. Now, of course, the younger generation of Christians need older Christians like you and me to help them hold the line. Well, some of you aren't older. Some of you are much younger. Some of you are young enough to be my children, my, my kids. So you guys that are younger need old people like me, older folks like me, to help you hold the line against worldliness and apostasy. Oh, if you're older folks like me, if you're in my category, we need to be pouring the word into the hearts and minds of these young people so they will recognize the distinction between truth and falsehood, between godliness and worldliness, because worldliness masquerades as light, and we need to show them how to see it for what it is. For those of you in your 30s and 40s, listen to these older folks. Not only don't disregard their wisdom, but pursue and seek their wisdom. Ask for their insight. Learn from them. Let them help you understand things that you need to know. Sin has a way of creeping up on every generation, and don't think it won't sneak up on you. Now, I read the stuff on Facebook written by young preachers, some of them that I know personally, and I see a creeping disdain for us old timers and an attraction to the new and exciting that draws a bigger crowd. And I want to tell you, once it becomes about drawing a crowd, it's no longer about serving your spiritual family. It's about serving yourself, building up your ego and your own self glorification. Well, the third thing is continue to serve your physical family. So even if you retire, you need to serve your family. And this is the primary reason I chose to use Manasseh as an example. Look in chapter 33, in verses 20 and 21. He, Manasseh dies, his son Ammon becomes king in his place. Ammon was just 22 years old, just like his father had been when he, his father became sole king. Now Ammon becomes king at the death of his father. He's 22, and he lasted a whopping two years as king. He was so evil, the first thing that he did is he tried to throw off all the changes his father had made, and then his own servants murdered him even though the people rose up and killed those servants. That's in verses 23 through 25. Now, here's my point about serving your physical family in your retirement years. It was a lost cause for Ammon. Manasseh's son was a lost cause. By the time Manasseh made a, a, repented and turned back to God, uh, Ammon was lost. Now, he may have been crazy. We don't know. There's got to be something really bad there when your servants rise up and kill you. 
And he was either crazy or power mad and would not listen to God or his own father. But his son, this is Manasseh's grandson, Josiah, became king in, verse, in chapter 34, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And Josiah was the last really, really, really good king in Judah and for in Jerusalem and for Judah. He was an awesome king. And he did everything he could to turn things around and serve God. But it seems like from from this eight years old, he was focused on that. And of course, when he got old enough to exercise his power and his power and authority, he really started enforcing the changes to restore Israel to Jehovah worship. So Josiah was eight years old when he was dad was murdered. But he was caught. But if you read about Josiah, what you see is he copied his grandfather Manasseh in trying to restore the nation to worshiping God. And so you think about this: if he was eight when his dad dies, that means he was six when his grandfather Manasseh died. Now, what do you think Manasseh did when he came back to Jerusalem after being rescued by God and forgiven when he repented? He probably tried to confront his son Ammon, realized that was a lost cause, and spent the next several years, maybe four years, uh, until he died when Josiah was six, pouring himself into that boy. He probably took him with him into the temple and with him when he was uh, rebuilding the temple and to worship God in the temple and, and showed him you know, all these idols, all of this uh, worship of false gods has to stop. This is, this is what we got to do away with worship Jehovah. And so he, and I know it's, it's speculation. I'll have to admit it's speculation, but I've been caring for my grandson now for a year since he was two years old. And I use every day to teach him to serve God. And I would hope that by the time he's six years old, I and my wife, along with his parents would have molded his heart to be one that seeks God. I know that it's going to continue well after that, but we're molding it right now. And I've seen it here at the West End Church of Christ in Bowling Green, Kentucky, with grandparents who are pouring themselves into their grandchildren. Instead of going off somewhere to enjoy the good life of retirement, they're pouring themselves into their children and into their grandchildren especially. So prepare for retirement by serving your children in the Lord and get ready to do the same with their children, with your grandchildren. Well, what are some ways we don't glorify God through our retirement? Well. That's pretty easy. Retire. Retire from serving the Lord's people. In Numbers 8, verses 25 through 26, there's a little bit of a story there of how that the, the Levites would have to retire at 50. But even though they retired, they could still stay and assist. So even if we're retired and we're not actively involved, we, we can be involved in helping and teaching the young people and guiding those and sharing our experience with those who are stepping in and taking over in those prime working years, especially in the prime working years in the church. So one way we don't glorify God is we step aside and let the young people take over and we get in our RV and we travel the US or we sell out and move to Florida or Arizona to enjoy the heat while we can and where we will have little or no influence. You know, as a former resident of Florida, lived in Florida for over 30 years. I can tell you this, the churches, especially around these retirement communities, are few and small. People don't go there to serve God. They just don't. Their life is already set, kind of like Ammon's that we talked about earlier. And the Levite males, they would celebrate. And what it says, they could continue to assist their brothers there in, in uh, Numbers 8, verses 24 through 26. So, and, and even if they didn't remain in Jerusalem, they could go back to their villages and teach, which was part of what the Levites work was supposed to be, teaching the people. And one that obviously, as you study the history of the nation, they apparently failed to perform on the, at the level they should have. So number one, you don't want to glorify God through your retirement, retire from serving the Lord's people. Secondly, retire from serving your family. But what, and that is that we look at it, retirement as a chance to get away from our kids. I'm tired of being responsible. I'm going to go to Florida so I can sit in the sun and play tennis or go play golf or hang out at the beach or play shuffleboard or whatever it is that you want to do. But instead, what we ought to be doing is looking at it as a chance to restore any frayed relationships because sometimes those that happens 
and build a connection with your grandkids. I'll tell you, I was one of 32 grandkids. My, my dad's mom and dad had 32 grandkids. And I was fortunate enough to be close to my dad's parents. I saw them almost every day until I went off to college. I picked peas and vegetables and went fishing with my grandmother. I went to the cattle auction and rode horses with my grandfather. And those are special treasured memories of a time that helped shape me. Be that person for your grandkids instead of retiring from serving your family and not glorifying God. Second Timothy one verse five talks about how Timothy, that the faith that's in Timothy dwelt first in his grandmother Lois and in his mother Eunice. And so there he was, his faith was built largely by his association with and training that took place in his mother's home, your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I'm sure that is in you as well. Proverbs 13, 22 says, good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren, but the sinner's wealth passes to the godly. Well, the next question is, what steps can we take to safeguard myself to, so that I will glorify God or to ensure that we glorify God through our retirement? Well, there are just a few that we'll go through here for a moment. First is, speak to God constantly and fervently. Pray. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Ceasing, put this in your heart and in your mind. Pray, teach your grandchildren to pray. Teach your grand, I try to teach my grandson to pray and it's something I have to work on just to pull him aside, not to pray just when we're eating or just for specific things, but just say, you know what I prayed about today? Let's pray about this Talk about and talk about that. So speak to God constantly and fervently. Do it with your grandchildren and do it for your grandchildren. Second thing is study God's word diligently. In Colossians 3, 16 and 17, this is a passage that talks about fill your hearts uh, with, the mind, with the word of God and sing. We know it from the singing because it talks about singing, but notice verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell within you. So the word dwells with the same way God dwells in us and the same way Christ dwells within us and, and inside us and the same way the Holy Spirit. They dwell in us through the agency or the medium of the word. So he says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you and with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thanksgiving, uh, thankfulness in your hearts to God. When we do that, then we're able to encourage our grandchildren, teaching them songs, teaching our grandchildren through songs. Drive around in the car with my grandson, we have a CD that we play of the Bible songs. And so we play it over and over and over again. Um, I don't think I remembered any of them until now. <laughs> so you do that. And then the third thing is you stick with your church family. Psalm 71, 18 says, even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. So old folks like me, if you're in your retirement age or retirement years, don't walk away from the church. Pour yourself into it. You want to declare your, the power of God to this next generation. Psalm 71, verse 18. So stick with your church family. Make yourself useful and a part of the work that goes on there in the church. Well, the next question is, what benefits can I have when I glorify God through my retirement? Well, they're not benefits in the sense of uh, a happy retirement and a life of ease. No, benefits are these. You're, you're beneficial to other people. First thing is young people are taught. Titus 2, 1 through 8 talks about that, about being teaching young people. And it's the idea of older people teaching younger people. We'll just read that for a second here. Titus chapter 1, verse 8. And uh, Titus, let's see, where are we? Titus chapter two, verses one through eight. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting the sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith and love and perseverance. Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible and all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine. 
dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us, about God's people. The young people are taught when older people glorify God in their retirement. And the second thing is the church is strengthened. You know, even the shortest, most brief study of church history confirms that congregations rise and fall. They'll rise and they'll fall. New generations arise who are connected more to their circle of fellowship, the church, and churches they're familiar with and confident in than to God himself. That happens. That's how denominationalism arises. They get connected to the group instead of to God. And that's a, that is a constant danger and, and something that we need to be warning young people about. If we want the West End Church of Christ to continue long after we're gone as a faithful church of God's people, we have to instruct the new generation that their first obligation is to God, not to West End. Now, let me repeat that. I want to repeat that. I want you to get this. We must instruct the new generation that their first obligation is to God, not the West End Church of Christ. Do you understand the difference? Because if we don't, they'll soon get it reversed, and within a decade or so, their allegiance will be to the West End Church of God instead of to Christ. And so the church will not be of Christ, even if the name is still the West End Church of Christ. Now, that's a whole different study, but that's one, and one worth spending some time working on and studying. But the next thing we're going to go to is that what are the consequences when I do not glorify God through my retirement? And there are. There are significant consequences. Well, God isn't glorified. We fail in our primary obligation of glorifying God. Our service and our life of service to God and our submission to God's will is designed and intended to bring glory to him. And so when we're not submitting to him in our retirement, God isn't glorified. Second thing is our church family suffers. We've been talking about the importance of teaching and, and the fact that the church will eventually fall if we don't teach young people to serve God first and that let that shape how they serve the church, our church family will suffer and our grandchildren will suffer. We want our grandchildren to be faithful to God. And so that's why we, the consequence when we don't glorify God through my retirement, or through our retirement is we hurt our kids. Now, what are some of the attitudes or characteristics that uh, are displayed or that I take on when I do not glorify God through retirement? Well, the first one is selfishness. We get solely focused on enjoying the golden years. I'll talk about the golden years next time when we talk about illness, because they're not as golden as people want us to think. But if we get focused on enjoying those, that's just about selfishness. So selfishness takes over when retirement is about what I can do that doesn't involve me having to do anything for the church or for the Lord's people or for my children or grandchildren. The second thing is blindness. We get the attitude is a blindness to how insignificant and short these golden years really are. The last thing is what sins are promoted when I do not glorify God through my retirement? Well, first thing is we waste, waste resources. We are a resource. Church has two things, financial resources and human resources, people and money, finances. And people are the source of the finances, but they're also the source of much other human capital, human uh, ability to get things done to help people. And if we're not doing that, we're wasting our time. Think of John. John was approximately 90 years old when he wrote the Gospel of John in the book of Revelation. He was an old man still serving God. So no matter our age, God still calls us to grow and invest our gifts and talents in the work that he is doing in the world. John served as an apostle into his 90s. Moses was 80 years old when he went to Pharaoh and asked for the freedom of the Israelite slave. And he continued working with and leading God's people until he died at age 120. Yeah, there's no retirement there. Daniel was in his 80s when he was thrown in the lion's den. And so don't sit around and say, I'm not of any value or any use just because I'm old. That is simply not true. And the next one is wasted time, wasted time. Ephesians 5.15 says, buy up the opportunity, seize the, uh, and make good use of your time 
So we need to renew our passion for God instead of letting it lapse and letting it die. Renew our passion for God, for God's people, for your fa our family. And uh, they're cutting a lot of hay around here in, in Kentucky right now, and there's a lot of sunshine, and so they're cutting the hay. So we need to make hay while the sun shines. That statement is reinforced. I, mean, I used to haul hay when I was in high school. It's been reinforced to me seeing the, all the hay that's been cut around here. And get started now. Don't wait until you're 80 years old. Don't wait until you're broken on your knees after years of wasted time like Manasseh. Start now. Start today. And then the third thing is, last thing is wasted influence. Wasted influence. Matthew 5.13 says, we're, if we waste our influence and in our retirement, we're like salt that has become contaminated, lost its taste, it's useless, it's to be cast aside into the garbage. Instead, we need to repurpose our knowledge and influence for the glory of God so that we don't waste our influence. Those are terrible, terrible things to allow us to get ourselves, allow ourselves to get caught up in doing. Don't do it. Well, that is a lot to think on. Now feel free to replay and pause to think and maybe make plans of how to apply some of these points in your life. But thank you for watching. Next Wednesday, next Wednesday will be glorifying God through my illness, time of illness. And we'll return to the group studies that we were talking about uh, on Zoom that will take place there. Thank you for watching. I appreciate so much that you're being a part of this. Think of how you can glorify God in your retirement. But most of all, whatever you are, whether you're in retirement and you're preparing for it or, or, you, or you're not and you're preparing for it, glorify God. Thank you for watching. God bless and we'll see you next time.